Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. Back in the summer of 1991, I was a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'd only been at the academy for a few weeks and was in the final stages of basic training when something strange occurred. Now, the academy itself is situated at the foothills of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Basically, if I stepped out of the cadet area, I would find myself standing amidst the mountains. There was an abundance of brush, trees, and various natural elements that could conceal just about anyone or anything you could imagine. One particular night, at around 9 p.m., my roommate and I were lying in bed, engaged in conversation about our upcoming campout in Jack's Valley. This was an area adjacent to the academy where we often conducted field training. As we were talking, we suddenly heard a blood-curdling scream, as if a woman were screaming at the top of her lungs. It was absolutely horrifying to hear. What struck me as most intriguing was that just prior to the piercing noise, we could hear other cadets in their room talking and joking, creating a lively atmosphere. The campus was winding down for the night, and everyone was preparing for the following day. I distinctly remember the ambient noise level being quite high. However, the moment that scream reverberated through the air, an eerie silence fell upon us. It was as if someone had muted the world around us. I turned to my roommate and asked if he had heard what I and everyone else had just heard. I know it seems like a dumb question. He looked at me and casually remarked, oh yeah, that the local Bigfoot. I couldn't believe my ears, but of course, I had heard it too. He went on to recount a story his friend had shared about encountering a big, hairy human drinking by a nearby lake. Apparently, when his friend noticed the creature observing him, it stood up, turned away, and disappeared into the forest. Needless to say, the following week in Jack's Valley was quite nerve-wracking for me. I found myself more worried about venturing out alone to the latrine at night than I was about navigating the challenging assault course. The possibility of encountering that mysterious creature, locally referred to as Bigfoot, haunted my thoughts and made every dark corner seem more ominous. On to the next one. Back in 2007, I was sent to Texas 
as a group of reinforcements for my construction company in Florida. We were asked to assist with a building construction project that my company was doing. This was a major project for us, and we were behind on schedule to compensate, and in hopes of catching up since all the work and wiring was being done on the interior, we went to a 24-7 rotating shift, seven days a week. Being the newest electrician to join the crew, I ended up getting the graveyard shift. The area where the building was going up was very wooded in the piney woods of East Texas, and on the outskirts of town, which allowed for more expansion and the inevitable growth of the town. The outside lighting of the complex was limited to basic security lights since the building was still under construction. The exterior of the building was complete and the front of the building was all glass windows. All the work we were doing involved the build out on the inside, so the building was lit up brightly. So, while there were no exterior lights, the area was brightly lit up from the interior rooms and lit the surrounding complex and extended out to the guard shack. The complex was surrounded by 10-foot tall fence with barbed wire to make sure no one or no animal were entering the property. One night during a break outside, I found myself in an open area surrounded by the densest woods I've ever seen. The woods were thick on the east side of the complex, and we only had security lights around the perimeter of the building. But there was a full moon out that night. I was walking around, stretching my legs, and warming up before going back inside. Over on the other side of the fence, something caught my attention. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. There was a figure that was moving in the woods. It seemed to step out from behind a tree and walk around like it was looking for something. It picked branches and moved rocks and leaves with its foot. I didn't know if it was searching or foraging for something to eat. It never looked over in my direction and it acted like it could care less if I was there. I watched it for about 30 seconds wondering what would be out in the woods at 3 a.m. The complex backed up to a nature preserve, so it could be almost anything. I watched as it vanished deeper into the woods, and I was unable to discern any distinct details except that it stood upright, was bipedal, covered in dark hair, and notably taller than me. I am a bit over six feet tall, and this creature was about a foot taller than I am. I was curious and perplexed at what I saw shifting around the trees. I didn't say anything to anyone when I got back to work, but after a few nights, it was really bothering me. So I discreetly asked my coworkers a few days later if they ever saw anything in the woods at night. Not surprisingly, none of them had ever witnessed anything like it in the area. Over the next few days, I started noticing that people were snickering and laughing when I walked by, so I assumed my story of the big, hairy creature in the woods had gotten around the building. I decided to not mention it again to anyone and just concentrate on my job. I made sure that if I took a break outside again, I took it on the other side of the complex. I didn't want to take a chance outside alone in the middle of the night, since I didn't get a good look at what was out there. I wasn't going to press my luck and end up in some sort of crazed Texas skirmish alone in the middle of the piney woods. All I knew is whatever was out there that night was big much bigger than I was. Initially, I considered the possibility that it might have been a black bear roaming around. However, black bears aren't known to inhabit this region of Texas. It would have been highly unlikely for one to have migrated from Louisiana 
just to pay us a visit, and I really don't think a black bear could have walked on two legs if this creature did. A few days after my conversation with a few of my coworkers, one of the security guards, an ex-Marine, told me he contacted the local sheriff department about a month earlier. He said he had a sighting in the very same vicinity during one of his night shift perimeter checks. And since this was a multi-million dollar project, anyone near the building that late at night was probably up to no good. The security guard leaned in a bit closer and confided in me that we were in Bigfoot country, as he called it. The guard said he had been patrolling and heard loud knocks on the trees out in the woods. He said it sounded like large branches being hit against the trunk of a tree, and it had a definite rhythm to it. He seemed to be up on his Bigfoot lore and started to tell me more about the smells and how the creature disappeared so quickly into the dark forest when he got nearby. I hadn't given it too much thought, but to hear him talk about the things he had seen at night while on patrol made me start to believe that the large figure I saw in the woods was a lone Bigfoot looking for food. I would never admit it to anyone, but he really started to have me doubt myself and to consider it was a Bigfoot that I saw in the woods. The security guard reporting this incident further added weight to the strange phenomena and events that were occurring in the area. On to the next one. There is the story of Mohit Gandhi, a 15-year-old who vanished for eight days in 2008 on Gunuk Tebu, a thick forested mountain region which rises to 1,039 feet above sea level in Jareth, Malaysia. The Uthustan newspaper reported Mohid was found today in a place that had been repeatedly searched by the search party, triggering a mystery that has confounded police. Even Mohid wonders how the search team and volunteers and even his own mother did not see him when he was in that same area since he had been reported missing. The boy himself said, During the period the search parties and people were searching for me, I came across the search party. I heard my mother call, but I couldn't do anything. It appears that he never left the area in which he had disappeared and was then subsequently found eight days later. He was there all the time, but the searchers couldn't see him even though he could both hear them and see them. And he could clearly see his mother searching for him. The newspaper wrote, State Police Chief Lub Hussein expressed complete astonishment because the boy was found only eight meters from the bridge on which he had last been seen. The police chief himself said, I was quite surprised that after all the places we were looking for him, behold, he was at the center of the public eye, by the river, and the funny thing is he's still in good health and showed no signs of fatigue. More than 130 rescuers had been searching for eight days for him, including the police, the army, and the People's Volunteer Corps. All the villagers nearby had joined in. None of them could find a trace of the missing boy until eight days had passed. And then he was there, standing by the river, yet oddly, he was no longer wearing clothes. He had on just a towel wrapped around his waist, and he was standing there just gazing out over the river. The boy, a boy scout himself, could not explain how he had came to be wearing the towel, nor why he says he had been hanging around the area the whole time, and yet no one had been able to see him there. His mother, Zaroda Awangis, said that she believed he had been hidden by the goblins, the Orang Bunyans. Star Magazine of Malaysia quotes another local hiker, William Lee, who says that white people may scoff at those who believe in the existence of forest spirits or the supernatural, he adds. 
Why do some people believe in God when they can't see proof of his existence? Often, those who don't believe in supernatural spirits and scoff at suggestion still won't dare walk through the forest or a cemetery at night. Another avid hiker interview called Nor Muzamil said, A few years ago, four of us were hiking and we could not get out of the forest. Usually, from where we were, it would have taken around one hour to come to the forest edge. But for us, even after several hours, we seemed to be trapped inside. We were walking along the trail, which was an old mud-filled logging trail, which every hiker knows about. But suddenly, the trail had turned into a gravel path. We knew this wasn't right because we had hiked it many times before and there was no gravel path. That's when we decided to all say silent prayers and we prayed, please let us go home and we apologize if we have offended anything in the forest and we asked for forgiveness. It was only after we had done this that the trail opened up and we could see the familiar landmarks we knew again. For us, we believe now that the forest has its own inhabitants, which we are not able to see. We know now that when we visit, we must not be cocky. We must show respect for the house rules. Pike Lean also has a story of the time something odd happened to her. Though she doesn't believe in forest spirit and has tried to rationalize what happened to her, she still can't explain it with any common sense answers. Twice it happened to me, in the forest, that I knew very well. I walked in circles, and I could not find my way out. When the searchers found me, the path was just there, right in front of me. Can I explain that? How could I have missed that? I don't know. Perhaps there are greater beings out there. Trekking Guide Trainer Thielen Govedan described the time he had been training a newbie guide in the forest one day when he began to hear beautiful music coming from somewhere in the woods. It was such an awesome sound, and I know it was not a bird or an animal. Yet the newbie had no reaction. She couldn't hear anything. Yet the music was so loud and beautiful, and it seemed to come so close to us. He said he felt like panicking, but he tried to stay calm and focused. He says he managed to maintain control of himself and get them out of the area calmly. After that, as soon as I got the newbie out of that part of the woods, I went back. As soon as I stepped back into that section, everything was back to normal. Sarimo Yusuf is another hiker who had an unnerving time when she was in the woods, she believed it all started when she innocently picked a strange flower as she neared the end of her hike. I felt strange as soon as I did it. I felt such sudden sadness, and yet I also didn't want to leave. I could hear a voice close to my ear. I felt tempted to follow the voice from below the hill. It was inviting me to follow it. Then I was crying hard. I didn't want to hear the voice anymore. I felt as if I was entering a different world. She had been with a party of hikers at the time, and the leader of the hike, tour guide, Kei Gansan, said that he remembered seeing her suddenly and inexplicably descending the steep hill by the abseiling rope going very fast. We heard a lady screaming and crying. We ran forward and saw it was the same lady who had roped down fast. We found her sitting at the base of a tree with both of her hands clutching her ears. Her head was down and she was shaking uncontrollably. We tried to calm her down and we tried to get her to walk with us. She was afraid of something we couldn't see, but she said it was following us. As we led her out of the woods, her fear changed to hysterical laughter. In our opinion, she had become possessed by something. Shrima says that her strange experience didn't end when she was led out of the wood. That night, I could still hear the voice screaming in my head. I couldn't sleep. 
A.R. Amrudin is a journalist with 25 years experience. He's also been a keen hiker and mountaineer all his life. You may call it superstition, but the spirit of the mountain and forest do exist, he says. They are the Penangu, the guardian spirits of these places. And now I always give due respect when trespassing in these places. There are taboos to observe. I know because I went through this mysterious journey. In the Cameroon Highlands of Pahang, I was under the spell of these spirits. It was during my climb when I was descending alone. I found myself going round in a circle. It was clear within the circle, which was surrounded by plants in flower. I could not see any other path to get out. I was trapped. I had no sense of time. My mind was blank. There was just silence and calm until two other members of the mountaineering team arrived from their descent. We were on a trek of five days. They asked me what I was doing. I told them to join me. They knew something was terribly wrong. My face was white. My behavior and body language totally out of the norm. And they said later that my voice was very forceful. They had to physically drag me out of the circle. None of us spoke for over an hour after that as we continued our descent. At the base, they told me what had happened. I had escaped from the clutches of the spirits. It was on this same expedition that another member saw a lake where none of us could. A different member believed that someone was following her, but whenever she turned around, there was no one there. She heard the footsteps, though. This wasn't my first experience. In the 1980s, I was riding my motorbike, going to a friend's house late one night after the sun had set. I saw something in a black cloak flying toward the graveyard opposite the army barracks. It was long-haired and flapping its arms like a bird, but it was a female. I know I saw it at close range, and it was not a figment of my imagination. It happened. I remember cold sweat dripping from my body as the surge of fever swept over me. I was shaking uncontrollably, and in bed that night, I developed a fever. Dr. Ong Hen Tat, an investigator of the paranormal in Malaysia, relates the strange case of the lost boys. The story began on a typical weekend at a busy tourist spot known as Fraser Hill, a tourist highland spot in Malaysia in June of 2005. It was always busy there, it being an excellent place for hiking. And among the tourists this day, was a group of families from Singapore. There were two brothers and one cousin, along with one of their fathers, who was accompanying them that day as they went to hike there. The boys wanted to trek Bishop's Trail, and the father said he would wait for them at the end of the trail, which was about an hour's hike away. He would then take them for lunch afterward, he said. The teenage boys were confident of hiking it alone because one of them was in the scout. So they set off with the agreement that they would meet the adult at the end of the route. However, the hour deadline came and went and there were no signs of the boys and the father began to worry. Another hour passed by and now he was frantic. He reported the boys missing and then began a five-day-long search. Within hours, both the police and the army were called in to help look for the boys, but they had no luck on the short trail. They found no trace of the boys. A troop of senior scouts were brought in, as they'd been successful previously, in finding another group of hikers who had gone missing on the same trail. Before they began their search, they prayed to the guardian spirits of the forest for help. Then one of the scouts placed a lit cigarette down into the earth and waited. The smoke from the cigarette started to drift toward the direction of a part of the forest which had been closed due to an earlier landslide. That part of the forest had been cordoned off 
because it was not safe anymore, and so it seemed unlikely that anyone would be beyond the restricted area. However, the scouts followed the direction of the smoke and went inside the cordoned off part of the forest, and before long, they found the lost boys. They were exhausted, but alive and without any injury. What they told the scouts, however, was very strange. They all said, as they walked along, they began to hear strange music, and they followed the sound of it until they reached an area that was unrecognizable yet astonishingly beautiful. They described the most vivid of colors and such brightness and beauty, and they went into the place as though they were entering another world altogether. And it wasn't until some time later that they realized they were lost. The scouts who had found them, though, this was particularly strange because the area they were describing was nothing but mud because of the landslide. They also thought it was very odd. The boys had managed to get into the park they had found them in, too, because the scouts themselves had to have sailed down a slope they couldn't understand how the boys had got to where they had. The local people who had joined in the search efforts for the boys were less surprised. They were certain the forest spirit had played a trick on the visiting boys. Dr. On Hen Tat, on describing the story, remarked that it's easy to put it down to a case of hiking without taking notice of the surroundings and getting lost quickly as tiredness sets in, perhaps. But what cannot be as easily explained away is that each boy attested to having heard the music and traveling into the strange world they had never seen before. He then adds another twist to the story, remarking that at the time the army and police were searching for the boys, a helicopter had been employed in the search effort, and the helicopter had sighted a large tiger walking very closely to the trail the boys would have been on had they not inexplicably diverted into the landslide area. Suddenly, a new angle to the story emerges, the doctor says, for if they had continued along the trail they were on, they may have well met the tiger. The Duto guardian angel must have seen this danger and intervened. A mystical world opened up to lure the boys away from the danger they were imminently facing. Perhaps the spirit opened up a path through the grove for the boys to go through, and then they sealed it up afterward against the tiger. On to the next one. In Valentine, in Cherry County, in Nebraska, I was six years old and playing hide and seek. I was with another young girl and we were walking down an alley looking for other kids when we saw a Sasquatch coming down the alley towards us. It was very tall and looked like an erect ape. It was very hairy and was making terrifying loud noises. We went running for the hill. I carried the memory for many years and I have never doubted that this was a true sighting. The only person that believed was a school teacher that lived on the street who heard the inhuman sounds it was making. It was probably between 7 and 8 p.m. It was after dark, but it was light enough there to get a very good look at it. The sighting was in town. On to the next one. In Gage County in Nebraska. While traveling southbound on Highway 77 near Blue Springs, Nebraska, I encountered a very large bipedal creature. As I came around a gentle left curve in the road, this creature stepped up out of the ditch on my side and with one stride was upon the roadbed and with two more strides was across and going down into the ditch on the other side. A car coming down the other way also saw this and we both slowed to a crawl as we came to the spot. I asked if they saw something and they responded they had also seen it. I was most impressed with the girth of the creature's legs and torso. It was massive and about seven to eight feet in height. 
I would estimate the weight to be about six to 700 pounds. The body was covered in medium length blackish brown hair and the face appeared to be less hairy. I was not close enough to see any facial features. The arms swung normally and they were longer than a man's proportionately. The quick stride and the movement was what impressed me the most along with the sheer mass. I'm familiar with the Bigfoot lore having lived in California, but I never thought I would see one, especially in Nebraska. There was a creek just south of where the creature entered the roadway. It seems it could have gone under the bridge if it wanted and remained unseen. It did not appear alarmed just quick. This incident occurred in the fall. I'm 50 and have been an outdoorsman all my life. The incident made me a believer, regardless of what people say, I've seen one. I did not stick around afterward, though. I wished I had gotten out and followed it. I was not equipped or properly armed. A car coming from the south also saw it. I confirmed this by asking them as we both crept by the spot in the road. We were both driving, myself southbound, and they were northbound. It was across Highway 77 in Nebraska, just north of an unnamed creek. With a small steel bridge near Blue Springs, Nebraska, the creature was in full view for less than five seconds and it moved with a purpose. On to the next one. On a country road which runs east along the Neobaro River in Holt County in Nebraska. In the fall, I was bow hunting for deer. Not seeing any sign of deer in an area, I decided to try another spot. I drove east along the Neobrara River, a road which along the south side there are somewhat steep dirt cliffs and wooded floodplains with swamps and marshes to the north. There are several ravines and creeks which flow into the river from the south. About five or six miles along, there was an area past the second auto gate in which people were allowed to hunt. I hunted this area but left before dark because my car was not too dependable and I did not want to get stranded after dark. Driving back towards where I started, I decided to look for deer in the ravines as I passed. I came to a ravine about four or five miles along. When I looked into the ravine, I saw a large gorilla looking thing about 40 to 50 yards away. I estimate it to be about seven feet tall and it had coal colored hair about three to four inches in length all over its body. I could only see it from about the knees up. Its face was more human than ape and lighter in color, kind of a dark tan color. I could not tell if it was its skin or very short hair on its face. It had almost nothing for a neck. It looked right at me for about two seconds. Then it turned around and ran on two feet up the ravine going south. When it turned, it twisted its whole torso as if a person with a sore neck would do. It turned from its right to its left. It also had thrown its right arm across its face as if to gain momentum for its turn or to maybe hide. As it turned, I could see its muscles of its upper back and shoulders ripple. This thing had to be very strong. When it ran, it made very little noise, crunching of twigs or leaves. I would guess its weight to be about 300 to 350 pounds. I got the feeling that the thing was traveling south to north to the river. I sat parked there for a few minutes, trying to put everything in order. I had heard stories about ape-like things out in the area and always just considered them as tall tales. I decided not to tell anyone because I did not think anyone would believe me anyway. Many years later, I did tell a few close friends and they just laughed. I know it's been a long time ago, but I can still see it in my mind. One of those things. I did not smell anything or did it make any ape or human sounds. I believe it was between 1630 to 1700 hours. The weather was clear and sunlit, however, in the late day, shadow of the ravine. It was a quarter mile south of the, the Neobrara River in an area of swamp, marshes, 
woods of various types of trees. On another occasion, I was home on leave from the army when a high school friend and I went out to visit his uncle who ranches on the Neobrara River in Nebraska. We were drinking beer and just talking about hunting when his small son said, Dad, tell them what you saw that one night. He told us that one night he was checking for new calves when he heard something behind him. He shines his light and saw two things looking at him. They were standing on two feet and had eyes that reflected red. They took off running on two feet. He said that they were not human. When I was about 10 or 11, I heard a rancher relate a story to my grandfather. One night, this rancher was awakened by a noise out in his barnyard. He stepped out on his porch and saw a large ape-like thing looking over and into the fenced area of his chicken coop. He claimed that the thing had to be eight feet tall. The rancher watched it for a few minutes and then said it sensed him somehow and ran off on two feet. I think his ranch was about 20 miles northwest of O'Neill, Nebraska. While in college, a friend had returned to Lincoln, Nebraska from a weekend at his home in Staplehurst, Nebraska. He told me that two of his close friends were raccoon hunting in a swamp that weekend near Staplehurst and their dog cornered a large ape-like thing. The two men were very scared and returned home. The sheriff and some patrol officers went to check it out. When the officers returned, the two men were told to keep quiet about it because it would scare people. Maybe there is a sheriff's report on this filed. It would be Stewart County. I took note of it because of my experience a year earlier, but I did not mention it to my friend. On to the next one. The first people to sound the mysterious creature alarm were several farmers whose dogs had been torn apart by some unknown beast. Town gossip heated up when the November 29th edition of the Daily Independent reported the story of Buster Dow, a trapper from Pickneyville who came upon some giant animal tracks that were larger than any he had seen in the more than 20 years of running traps in southern Illinois. Dow was busy checking his traps in the Beku Bottoms near Pickneyville when he stumbled upon a track larger than that of a black bear. Puzzled by the sheer size of the monstrous track, Dow bent down and scooped out the moist clay bearing the imprint and brought it to town, where it was put on display for all to view. Rumors of a bear being spotted swimming in a local strip mine reservoir caused many to conclude that the track had also belonged to a bear. Yet, by all accounts, the track on display was just too large to be that of an average black bear. The track was enormous enough to give Buster Dow pause as he told the Daily Independent that he was going to trap somewhere else because he didn't want to lose any trap or himself. After the giant track story was printed, the entire region seemed to spin out of control, with monster stories each new account more bizarre and unusual than the previous. Now that the trapper story had broken down the paranormal dam, numerous other bizarre stories came flooding in. And luckily, the entirety of these rather odd sightings were covered by the December 3rd edition of the Daily Independent. First up was the town of Verneth, where folk were firm in their conviction that the varmint reported on the loose was a black bear. Yet, not everyone was ready to jump on the black bear bandwagon, including Herman Rubosch, who owned a farm south of Steelville that had not yet escaped the paranormal wave that was engulfing the region. During the previous few nights, when darkness crept over his land, Rubash noticed that his dogs would spend the evening cowering as strange howls echoed across the farm. Not one to partake of all the monster nonsense, Rubash instead believed that an ocelot was the one striking fear into the heart of his dog. Around the same time, a hunter named Ulrich claimed that a bobcat passed by him when he popped off a shot at it. 
either Ulrich Smith or the bullet had no effect because he was unable to produce a carcass. Not looking to be outdone by an ocelot, highly sensational report from Denmark, Illinois, claimed that wild deer had been chasing down and wounding local cattle livestock, and perhaps they were the ones responsible for all the mysterious killings. In the span of a few days, the discovery of the giant animal track had transformed from being that of some unknown animal to that of a bear, then to an ocelot, and finally rampaging deer. Now, thanks to Miss Alma Davis, the supernatural compass was about to slingshot back to the bear theory. Miss Davis told the Daily Independent that a wild animal was in her yard last night and set the dog barking. When she popped her head out the door to observe what was happening, she was greeted by a deep-throated growl that sounded just like the bears at the St. Louis Zoo. Back in Verness, Miss E.G. Steinhammer was having similar problems with her own dogs who were busy raising a row on the front porch. Curious, Miss Steinhammer began walking to the porch to see what all the commotion was about when the sound of a large animal lumbering around the front porch froze her in her tracks. Too afraid to open the door, Miss Steinhammer wisely chose to wait out her heavy-footed visitor. The Harrisburg Daily Register ran an article on October 15th with the headline, Offer Reward for Strange Animal Near Murfreesboro. Local businessman Harry Greenberg, who owned a metalworks company on the outskirts of town, offered up a $100 reward for the capture of a strange animal that had been plaguing his business. One main oddity of this case was the fact that witnesses reported it to be anything ranging from a wolf, bear, or just plain old varmint, and they could not settle on any similar physical description. The newspaper claimed employees of Greenberg's company can't seem to agree on a description of the creature which they say prowls around the railroad yard on the north side of town. It wasn't so much that witnesses couldn't agree on what the monster looked like, but more so, it appeared almost as though they were seeing completely different animals. Some claimed it was too large for a squirrel, while others stated it was a wolf with a bushy tail. Perhaps the strangest account came from a witness the newspaper described as being a vagrant, who reported that he was certain the creature was definitely a bear because he had watched it walk upright on its hind legs as it crossed over the railroad track. Once it was over the tracks, the creature crouched down on all fours and bounded off into the woods. As far as we can tell, no one ever laid claim to the $100 reward offered for the creature's capture. According to an article in the Murfreesboro American, an early version of the monster legend first hit the paper, the Daily Independent, in the early 50s. It appeared to spend most of its free time at the Murfreesboro Iron and Metal Company. The workers at the time had constant spottings of the monster. Apparently, an intrepid newspaper reporter heard about the odd monster sightings and staked out the area in hopes of discovering the beast's true identity. The reporter was said to have spotted something moving quickly through the yard, but no further details were provided. On to the next one. In 1968, another round of monster frenzy was being whipped up by the residents around Chittyville, Illinois. An article in the August 19th edition of the Southern Illinoisian featured the headline, 10-foot-tall, what's it, reported seen. It appeared that the 10-foot-tall thing was once again up to its old trick this time scaring unsuspecting motorists in rural areas of the country. This sighting originated out in the sticks, where 22-year-old Tim Bullock was out riding with his 17-year-old girlfriend, Barbara Smith, in an unincorporated area north of Heron, Illinois. About 8.30 at night, the young lovebirds were greeted by an unwelcome visitor who began tossing dirt at the car. Bullock reported that the dirt was thrown at him through his window, 
while another larger object went sailing over the top of the vehicle. Thinking that perhaps they were on the receiving end of some pranksters, the couple scanned the woods in search of the culprit. Bullock failed to notice anything. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for Smith, who began screaming at the sight of a huge, ten-foot-tall black monster lurking in the woods. Smith got a good look at the beast, and saw hair covering its giant steering wheel-sized head. Shaken and unwilling to stick around to investigate the monster's intentions, the couple raced out of the area and quickly reported their unusual encounter to the police. Feeling a bit braver in the safety of sunlight, Bullock returned to the area the next day and discovered a large depression in the grass indicating a large animal had rested or slept there. Word of the couple's strange incident quickly spread, and it was soon discovered that Bullock and Smith were not the only ones from the area to have had an encounter with the unknown. A car hop at the local drive-in restaurant stated that a customer had pulled into the restaurant and was hysterical as he or she recounted a terrifying run-in with a monster. You will have to use your imagination on this one because no further details of the encounter were given. Continuing with the general vagueness was the report that another motorist had spotted the monster prowling the area alongside Route 148, but once again, no further details were provided. As is often the case in monster sightings, the area around Chittyville became overrun with thrill-seekers, monster hunters, members of the media, and the just plain curious, all hoping to catch a glimpse of the frightening 10-foot What's It? Perhaps all of the commotion had scared the creature out of the area because no additional sightings were reported. At least, not for a while, that is. In the 1970s, monster sightings began slowly. The witness, Leroy Summers, was living in Cairo, Illinois. Cairo is a river town if there ever was one. The town is perilously placed on a strip of land only one mile wide sandwiched between the Mississippi River to the west and the Ohio River to the east. A late-night jog by Summers that fateful Tuesday evening in July must have begun like so many before, but this one would end abruptly when the big muddy monster made an appearance. Summers was jogging along the levee running parallel to the Ohio River somewhere between 17th and 28th Street. The rhythmic pounding of feet and deep concentrated breath are the music of pre-portable music players. Summers was startled when he eyed a sizable, human-shaped silhouette standing by a brick building ahead of him. Summers continued his jog, drawing closer to the figure that seemed more mysterious with each step. The shape of the silhouette grew clearer, less human, and more monster. He estimated that it stood at least ten feet tall and had a large head. The body was covered in long white hair with light red coloring around its middle. The color possibly came from dried clay mud from the river or with actual red hair mixed with white. Summers, who felt unsafe, didn't stick around for a closer look. He informed the police at first opportunity. The police, taking him seriously, dispatched officers to the site. On to the next one. A woman living near Kell, about 50 miles northeast of Murfreesboro, sighted a very large, beige-colored creature crouching not far from her house at the edge of the nearby woods. The witness had several dogs which barked wildly, then charged the creature, though all the while keeping a safe distance. When the monster stood up and took a step forward, the dogs retreated to the house and dashed inside. The witness remained inside until sometime later, when she felt it was safe to step out. On to the next one. A 23-year-old woman finished chores on a family farm 50 miles northwest of Murfreesboro at Prairie de Rocher, a small settlement with a long history. A crackling fire and a bedroll are readied for peaceful night rest under the stars Bacon sizzled over the open fire between her corralled horse and a sinkhole, 
old enough for trees 20 feet high to be growing from its bottom. Suddenly, an odd, unnerving grunt from the sinkhole breaks her peaceful routine. The German shepherd at her side stares in that direction. The nearby horses begin to snort and stomp at the ground in response to the continuing grunt. The trees growing from the sinkhole suddenly shake more vigorously by the moment. Then she notices a faint, odd smell. She doesn't move. Grunts turn to screeches, then screeches to near screams. The would-be camper and her dog stand only ten feet from the sinkhole. The trees resume their shaking, only now more violently, notwithstanding their six-inch wide trunk. The witness has had enough. She douses the fire, piles the dog and herself into the nearby truck, and rides off on Route 155. In a follow-up interview, the witness said they were missing a lot of sweet molasses horse feed from the nearby barn, and that the loft doors inside the barn were consistently and mysteriously left open. On to the next one. Riverside Park runs along the banks of this monster's namesake, the Big Muddy River. According to the Southern Illinoisian newspaper, an encounter occurred just minutes before Monday was over. 19-year-old Randy Needham and 28-year-old Judy Johnson were parked near the boat ramp at Linden Avenue and South 23rd Street in Murfreesboro. A hideous shriek suddenly warned the couple that an unwelcome, unexpected intruder had wandered into their vicinity. The sound emanated from the wooded area nearby. Needham then noticed a seven-foot-tall, mud-covered man walking toward them. Screaming non-stop, the large monster continues moving toward the car. The monster had light-colored hair matted with mud. Even more unnerving, the roar had changing tones and the screams would change into growl. No human would be able to scream or make a noise loud as we had heard. The couple fled before the creature got any closer. Immediately, they drove to the Murfreesboro Police Station and arrived at 11.55 p.m. The police account says they reported sighting some type of creature in the wooded area north of the Big Muddy River next to the boat ramp parking area. Officers Jimmy Nash and M. Lindsay were dispatched to investigate the area. Upon arriving at the boat ramp, they spotlighted the entire area and were unable to locate anything unusual. Needham eventually arrived back at the boat ramp to show the officers exactly where he had seen the monster. The police report implies that Needham came back to the boat ramp with or at the same time as Deputy Sheriff Bob Scott. The investigation carries over into the earliest part of Tuesday, and at some point, officers located impressions in the mud. The unexplained impressions were approximately three to four inches deep, 10 to 12 inches long, and approximately three inches wide. Not only were these impressions unusual enough to confound these four or five locals, they were also deemed worthy of inclusion in the police report. The excitement or intrigue must have been palpable when officers Nash and Lindsay, along with Deputy Scott and Witness Needham, returned with fresh supplies, tall boots in tow. They continued their search into the less forgiving areas near the riverside. The officers found more prints in the mud, similar to the other prints found. The newly discovered prints were deeper in the mud and not as long as the other ones had appeared. The prints were documented as very erratic in that no two were the same distance apart. Some of the impressions were five to six feet apart, while others were found very close together. Officer Tincher would eventually become Murfreesboro's police chief. Tincher says on recalling the print, they were huge, but they were all fallen in. He said the river had previously flooded the entire area surrounding the boat launch where Needham and Johnson were parked that night. The water had only recently receded, leaving behind a muddy mess, the resulting soft mud rendering tracks a soggy mess, useless for the sort of detailed information necessary for scientific analysis. Officer Nash was frightened enough to draw his service revolver during the night of the sighting. Officer Nash, along with Deputy Scott, were near the water's edge, searching for other clues 
and hopefully more footprints. As Nash bent over to examine a print, a shrill, loud screech rang out of the nearby dark woods. Startled, Nash dropped his gun. He and Scott fled the area without even pausing to retrieve the firearm. Only later did Nash work up the nerve to retrieve it. In Nash's estimation, as expressed to fellow officers, the noise was no screech owl, no coyote. I don't know what that was. Persons connected to the sighting attest that at the time of its occurrence, the two principal witnesses who alerted the police were married, but not to each other. They had much to lose in coming forward, but did so regardless. These facts, along with the manifest sincerity, along with the sincerity of Needham and Johnson, were enough to persuade everyone at the police station that the two had encountered an unnatural phenomenon. Police concluded that the incident report should remain open. On to the next one. It all happened back when I lived in Michigan. My parents and I resided in the tiny town of Fenville. Don't be alarmed if you've never heard of the place. Most people haven't. The population has to be one of the smallest in the country. The only reason we lived there was that my father owned a company that provided both landscaping and handiwork services. He started the business when I was 17 years old, and pretty much everyone in the town hired him and his employees for home maintenance. He did very well for himself, so he was able to retire early. He and my mother moved to Naples, Florida, while I was in my sophomore year at college. Neither he nor my mom claimed to have ever seen anything like what I encountered a few years before they moved away. I was 16 years old when I spent most of my summer working for a farmer named Gus. He didn't run a big operation or anything. He was just a middle-aged fellow who had a few acres with a couple of horses, cows, and had recently built a chicken coop. He decided he could give back to the community by selling natural products at a local farmer's market on Friday mornings during the summer. When I think back on it, I'm not sure he really needed my help, but I think he was more so doing it as a favor for my father, who he had known for many years. Funny enough, my father never let me work for his company because he thought it was more beneficial to have a boss or supervisor that I wasn't related to. Anyhow, it was my third summer working for Gus, and all three years, my job mainly revolved around cleaning up after his animal. Occasionally, he would have me do other things, like paint a fresh coat on the storage shed or section of his house. There was so much open land encompassing his property, which is another thing that baffled me about never spotting the strange creature before my encounter. One of the best perks about working for Gus was how he would let me take home bottles of fresh milk, cartons of eggs, and sometimes vegetables from his extensive garden, depending on what he didn't need for the upcoming farmer's market. My mother loved that, and she'd use the product in almost all of her recipes. She insisted that the freshness of those items made everything taste better. One summer day, I was riding my bicycle home from work with an assortment of farm goods when I heard what sounded like a large dog running behind me. It was drizzling when this happened, so the wetness of the pavement made the noises more perceptible. When I looked over my shoulder, I was initially confused. Like many other Sasquatch reports, I first wondered why this dirty man was coming towards me on all fours. He seemed to be moving at a slightly diagonal angle, leading me to suspect they were injured and limping. Their mouth was hanging wide open because it seemed to be gasping for air. Even though everything quickly became a blur due to the adrenaline, one thing I specifically remember is how there were these very long, scraggly white hairs dangling from its massive chin. There was also something about its eyebrow ridge that was so unique. It was so prominent, like what you would expect to see on a caveman if you could go back in time. There is no question that I began pedaling harder than I ever had in my life. 
The sound of the milk bottle vibrating in the metal bike basket became so noisy that it ended up muffling any sounds of the wild man. Even though my leg muscles worked harder than they ever had before, this thing was still gaining on me. I ended up tossing the eggs and milk into the grass alongside the road. I can't begin to express how relieved I was when the wild man stopped chasing me and veered toward the food item. I didn't know about the eggs, but I know the bottle couldn't break because I watched the wild man remove the cap and pour some of the milk into its mouth. When I think about it now, I probably should have stopped to take a longer look once I was far enough away from the wild man. There was no question that the food items were the primary interest. Still, even though it seemed pretty evident that it no longer felt any desire to follow me, there was a voice in my head that warned me to get out of there while I still could. All these years later, I don't know if that was a primal instinct or my insecurities telling me to get the heck out of there before the wild man ran out of food and drink. There exists the part of me that wishes I would have waited at least a little longer to find out. Of course, that kind of thing is so much easier to say after the matter. I sometimes forget how hard my heart was beating in the heat of the moment. Since it occurred, I've had a lot more time to let the whole thing sink in and look at it a lot more objectively. The encounter started as one of the scariest things I could have imagined, but quickly transitioned into a situation that almost felt non-threatening. I just didn't have the courage or composure to see it at the time. I wonder what might have happened had I not had the food items on me. Would the wild man have perceived my flesh as an opportunity for nourishment? In the wild, desperate times call for desperate measures. I never again saw the wild man, nor did I ever hear anyone else from Fenville mention having seen anything like it. I did tell a few of the people I was close to, including Gus, but their transparent disbelief deterred me from talking much about it. A lot of people want to share their stories, but are so worried about being mocked or, in some cases, even losing their job. It's such a crazy world that we live in regarding how we're expected to abide by a certain standard or face significant consequences. As long as you're not causing any harm to anyone, I think you should be able to say whatever is on your mind. Without that, how can we ever truly push the barriers of science and learn more about these miraculous aspects of life? I just feel like there's this constant, blatant attempt to keep people dumbed down so that they remain part of the system. On to the next one. It was less than two years ago that my wife and I were on a road trip from San Francisco to Portland. When the sighting happened, we were on a stretch of the I-5 highway between Mount Shasta, California and Ashland, Oregon. One of the strangest aspects of what we saw was that it occurred in a much more barren landscape than I would have ever expected to see something like it in. We hit the road very early that morning and I remember the sunrise had just begun. The colors in the sky were spectacular. About half a mile up ahead, we saw some cars pulled over along the side of the road. We figured that they had merely stopped at a place that enabled them to get some snapshots of the scenery that very much resembled a pastel painting. But it was soon after we got out of our car that we learned something else had caught their attention. Those are very rare apes. I heard a man say to his kids as I walked by, trying to locate an optimal view. At first, I assumed that I had misunderstood the guy, but soon after that, I aimed my phone toward the sunrise and noticed the band of moving shapes. There were six of them altogether. Even though there were maybe 200 yards off, there was no question that these things were something other than human. I often think about how calm and casual that man was when he explained to his children that they were looking at rare apes. It sounded no different at all from when a parent is educating their child on whatever animal you typically find in a zoo. Maybe I'm making a big deal out of it, but it just came off as so damn weird to me. Trust me, 
when I tell you that there was absolutely nothing at all typical about what we were staring at. I guess the guy was just trying to prevent his kid from getting scared. So my wife and I, along with what was probably about seven or eight other people, stood there gazing at this caravan of odd-looking humanoid shapes. When I laid eyes on the group, the first thing I thought of was the hunchback of Notre Dame. Every one of these beings back was hunched, and their long arms dangled below, occasionally appearing to push off the earth. Even though they were far away, you could tell that they had very thick and durable frames. Five out of six of the figures were nearly equal in size, and the other one was maybe a little over half of that, leading me to suspect it was one or two of the creature's offspring. The part that baffles me the most about this sighting is that these travelers were nowhere near dense forest. Even though the landscape was hilly, there was nowhere for them to hide, which is why I'm so confused about how they ended up at that location in the first place. There are many square miles of open land in that area, yet they decided to venture relatively close to a frequented highway. That just makes no sense to me. I don't even recall seeing a single tree in that area, aside from whatever covered the surface of the mountain range, way off in the distance. Those mountains had to be miles away. At the time we pulled over and parked, nothing was obstructing our view of them. Therefore, nothing was preventing them from seeing us. As far as we could tell, they seemed utterly unfazed by the presence of their spectators. Since they were far off, it didn't appear that the group was moving very fast, but I'm confident it was much quicker than what you would see from a group of human hikers. The size of their limbs alone would make it much easier to cover more ground with less effort. What's unfortunate is that these creatures were still too far away for the lens of any smartphone to capture their unique trait. However, I did see at least a couple of other people with professional grade cameras. My wife and I had hoped that we could easily be able to locate that footage on the internet, but either we haven't been searching the web with correct keywords, or they never uploaded anything. My wife said she'd heard about our authorities removing stuff like that from the internet, but I'm not sure whether I can take the whole conspiracy route too seriously. I know there are things that our government doesn't want us to know, but I just have trouble seeing what motives they would have for suppressing this kind of thing. Even though the creatures were too far away to view their eyes or any facial features, we could still make out that they were covered with dark hair from head to toe. It's no wonder that they traveled during the early morning hours because that area would have been scorching in the afternoon. Someone once asked me if I'm certain that they weren't dogmen, and I told them that I didn't see any sign of protruding ears or snout. I always thought that it was a funny question because it felt like this guy implied that a dogman sighting would be more believable. The rising sun effect made the whole scene appear very cinematic, and it soon became clear that the band of travelers was veering towards the other side of the hill they were currently trekking across. Suddenly, a small child that was with a couple of people parked beside us began crying hysterically. I doubt she could have been any older than two years, and I don't even know whether her distress was associated with the creatures. Regardless, my wife and I heard someone yell, look, it's looking at us. I turned my head back toward the hill, got the first glimpse of how tall these things were. Even though the other creatures didn't appear very fussed, the single, fully erect one looked concerned. Its posture reminded me of when a prairie dog are on high alert due to a nearing threat. I can't be sure whether the child's crying triggered its behavior, but before we knew it, the erect creature was charging toward the highway. Even though it was still so far away, the amount of ground that it quickly covered motivated people to begin heading toward their cars. Come on, sweetie, it's okay, the crying child's father said as he scooped her up in his arms. The creature was now running towards us so fast that we could make out little clouds of dust getting kicked up behind it. There's no question that I was frightened, but I also felt tempted to stick around a little longer 
because it seemed like each passing moment enabled a more detailed view of the approaching being. I only got a brief view of the thing's facial features, and I remember thinking they were so much more broader than those of any human. I've heard some people say they look like cavemen, but I didn't see it that way. The face was entirely different from anything else I'd ever imagined a Sasquatch to look like. I'll go as far to say that the closest thing they resembled in my mind was the face of a sloth, but unfortunately, I got such a quick look at those features because I was within a football field's length away. My wife pretty much dragged me back to the car. That was when I noticed that we had been the last ones to seek shelter. My wife entered the driver's seat and sped off immediately. There was something about that approaching creature that made her panic. I guess I was just so amazed by the sighting and they somehow overpowered any feelings of fear. I so badly wish someone would get a hold of the body of one of these things and perform an autopsy so we can learn precisely what they are. Like I said before, I assumed that I would be able to find the footage or at least a photo of the event on the internet. But neither of us has had any luck. I imagine that some of the other people who pulled over acquired a passion for studying Sasquatch afterwards. My wife and I would love nothing more than to speak to someone else who experienced that whole thing. On to the next one. My story took place in the summer of 2010, in early August. I was between jobs as in unemployed, so I decided to take some of my savings and do something I've always wanted to do, go to Canada. I've always wanted to see the Canadian Rockies, so I got my passport, and since I have three dogs, I got their shot all current along with the veterinarian exam papers that Canada requires. After all that, I was never asked to see the dog's papers, but I sure didn't want to risk not being legal. I live in Wyoming, so I decided to just head north and see the country at a leisurely pace. I went through the Tetons and Yellowstone and finally arrived at Glacier National Park about three weeks later. I was an old hand at camping, having done it since I was a kid. I was camped kind of illegally in Glacier, way out on a back dirt road off the highway that loops from St. Mary's around to Hungry Horse, the back road that most tourists don't take, as they want to go over the Going to the Sun Road. It was a sweet camp, and I set up my big tent and all, and I knew nobody ever went in there because the grasses were growing so high you could barely find the road, which ended at my campsite. And man, what views. I could look down and see St. Mary's Lake and huge distant waterfalls from my tent door. It was paradise. Because of finding this great spot, I decided I'd go up into Waterton National Park in Canada and make it a one-day trip instead of packing up and then trying to find a camp spot up there. A friend who had been up there told me that the park would be very crowded that time of year. I wanted to spend most of my time in Canada in Banff and Jasper National Park. I wanted to backtrack through Montana and cross the border north of Caliphel, so I wanted to come back down that way anyway, no need to change camps. I got up really early and made some coffee, filled my thermos, fed the dogs, grabbed some lunch stuff, and then we all jumped into my pickup and headed for Canada. It was a beautiful drive, and we crossed the border with no problems, and were soon coming down the grade into Waterton. I couldn't believe the size of these mountains. Even though I'd just been in Glacier, they seemed bigger and even more magnificent. I had to stop several times to just sit and stare. Well, I made it into Waterton, and boy, I was disappointed. The park advertises itself as a quiet, untrammeled place, and I suppose 
It is in general, but the little town of Waterton is a tourist trap bar none. It was hard to even find a place to turn around, and the streets were packed with people walking around, with nowhere to even park. I drove around a bit, checked out the little waterfall there, then left, heading for Cameron Lake, which is at the end of a windy road that climbs high in the mountains above Waterton. The lake was beautiful, with a white glacier hanging above its far shores. But, once again, it was crowded with people. You could rent canoes here, and the lake was just hopping with boats. I found a little side trail that I had no idea where it went, but it said dogs were allowed, so I put everyone on leashes and headed out. They needed a hike. I hadn't gone more than 50 feet when I was greeted by a group of 20 people coming up the trail, yelling and laughing and all that. I don't usually mind people, but, well, okay, I do mind people when I want solitude, and I especially wanted to let the dogs stretch their legs a bit. This wasn't the place. We got back in the truck and headed back down the windy road. I was too busy watching the road and dodging RVs to even see much of the scenery, and there were almost no places to turn off and get out. So that was kind of a blur. I decided to go see a place called Red Rock Canyon. It was the opposite direction from how I'd come into the park, so I turned left at the bottom of the hill and let everyone else go back to Waterton. Good riddance. Red Rock Canyon sounded attractive to me because the name reminded me a bit of the Red Rock Desert in Wyoming. I guess I was getting a bit homesick by that time. The Canadian Rockies are all sedimentary rock, not granite or volcanic, which makes them truly spectacular because they have lots of layers and colors. Red Rock Canyon sounded like a place I should see. One thing I discovered about Waterton was that you could hike with your dogs. Unlike the national parks in the U.S., which I found to be a very cool thing about Canada, well, there wasn't much traffic on the Red Rock Road, which was nice, and it wasn't all narrow and windy. Once you got up above the highway a bit, it kind of went through a big, wide valley with a nice creek running through with lots of willows. A good place for moose. I remember thinking, though I never did see any. I hope I'm not getting into too much detail here and boring you, but I really want to paint a picture of how it was. Anyway, I hadn't gone more than a few miles when I saw a sign saying that the road to the canyon was closed at a certain point for construction. Great, no Red Rock Canyon for me. I was getting kind of fed up with Waterton National Peace Park, as Canada called it, pretty as it was. By now, I needed to get the dogs out. I spied a campground to the left across the creek, so I turned in there. But the signal said full, so I just turned around and went on down the road. Too many people everywhere. You have to remember that I'm from Wyoming and there's almost no one around where I live, so I'm not used to many people. Before long, I came to a turnout that had a historical marker, so I stopped there. I read the marker, and I can only recall that it was something about the natives there and some explorer, but I don't recall anything about who or when. I let the dogs out for a minute, and they went into the bushes and did their thing, then I decided this would be a great spot to get them out for some exercise. I was kind of wishing I just stayed at my camp in Glacier as we would have had a nice day just goofing around there. But on the other hand, at least I'd seen Waterton now, or a bit of it anyway. But we were used to getting out, and we needed some exercise. We were headed up a big hill that appeared to be part of the foothills of a big mountain, that rose above them. I mean a really big mountain. It was beautiful, all layered in various shades of red. 
the dogs were really happy to be out, and we all kind of bounded up this big hill for a bit. I had to stop and catch my breath, and the views were stunning. I was really enjoying this, and now liking Waterton, and so were the dogs. But all of a sudden, the dog stopped cold. They just stood there looking ahead, and as I came up behind them, I could see that the one closest to me, Otis, was shaking. I've never seen my dog shake. I then noticed they were all shaking. Before I could even say a word, two of them had turned and were hightailing it back to the truck as fast as they could go. We hadn't come very far, so they were back down there really fast, and I could see them crawling under the truck. Now Otis was running back too. He was very protective of me, and I'd never seen him do anything like that. I decided it must be a grizzly bear, and maybe they could smell it, where I couldn't, and I'd better pay attention. So I was soon also heading back at a good clip. I unlocked the truck and everyone jumped in, which was unusual as I typically have to get after them. They always want to fiddle around smelling everything. I jumped in and locked the doors. Now I started scanning the hill, wondering why we were all so scared. I finally rolled down my window, but I didn't hear or see anything. By now, another car had pulled up to read the sign, and they smiled at me and got out and acted like everything was fine. I was puzzled. What had the dog sensed or smelled? I've been a bit of a photographer since I was a kid, even though I never could afford nice equipment. But most of my stuff was landscape photos, as there wasn't much where I lived except deer and antelope, in that in the sense of wildlife. But ever since going through Yellowstone, I'd come to understand why people are so attracted to wildlife photography. I'd taken some photos there of wolves and buffalo and even a huge great horned owl. So I was kind of hoping the grizzly would come out to where I could get some photos. From the safety of my truck anyway, and where I could get away fast. I sat there a bit, even though the dogs were again shivering. I have a club cab, and Sonny and Maggie were in the back, hiding on the floor. My dogs are all lab, and they're happy-go-lucky, and I don't think they think enough about things to get scared much. Even fireworks usually don't bother them, so I knew this had to be something really scary. I rolled the windows back up. The other car left. I started the pickup and turned it, so I could make a quick getaway if needed then turned it off and just sat there. Whatever it was, it was still around, according to the dog. I got my camera ready to go. By now, it was getting on towards late afternoon. It had been a long day, and I wanted to take a picture of this grizz. Then I would head back to Glacier. Just then, something huge jumped into the back of my truck. I have a camper shell, so whatever it was, it had to have jumped onto the bumper. The whole front end of the truck came up, including the front wheel. We just hung there in the air for a minute. I was shocked and dropped my camera. I couldn't see what was holding the truck up, but it was something big. I hadn't seen anything coming, which was really strange as I kept looking around and in the rearview mirrors. Just then, I heard a breaking sound. My truck was falling apart. The front came down with a wham, and I nearly smashed my nose into the steering wheel. I had the presence of mind to start the truck and slam it into gear and peel out while I could. Dirt and rocks went flying into the air, and I know they must have hit this thing in the face as it had to be standing directly behind me. As I peeled out onto the blacktop, I felt something slam against the side of the truck and I saw a big tree branch rolling down the road behind me. By then, I had the accelerator floored and was quickly getting up speed, but not fast enough because I noticed something in my passenger side rear mirror, and this really shook me up. Something big and human-like was chasing me, wearing a fur coat 
and it had nearly caught up. It looked like it was trying to grab onto the door handle. I reached down and hit the auto lock, making sure all the doors were locked. By now, Otis was whining his head off in the seat beside me. Maggie and Sonny were still on the floor, so I couldn't see them at all. By now, my truck had ramped up, and we were finally able to leave this thing behind. I never did get a really good look at it, but I can tell you this. It was no grizzly. What I did see was that it was huge and covered in light brown, long flowing hair. It was a Canadian Sasquatch. And you can believe me or not, it doesn't matter either way, because I know what I saw. I drove like a madman towards Red Rock Canyon, the direction I'd had the truck pointed. I'd forgotten the road would be closed, so I was surprised when I got a mile or two down the road and saw a flagger ahead wearing orange. It was a woman, and she stopped me and told me I had to turn around and go back. I was in shock, and I told her I couldn't turn around and go back. I hardly knew what I was saying. She said I had to turn around as they were working on the road. I just sat there. Finally, another car came up behind me, so I decided I would turn around, then follow it back. There was no way I was going through that stretch of road alone. I turned around and pulled over to let the other car go around me. It then dawned on me that I should get out and see how much damage my truck had taken. What I saw really messed with my mind. My entire bumper was gone, and there was a big dent where the tree branch had hit just above the wheel well. It also dawned on me that I needed to get that bumper back as it had my license plate on it. I would get pulled over with no plate, and what was I to say, that a Sasquatch had torn it off? I had to stop back there and get it, but I couldn't. There was no way. About then, a pickup came along with Montana plates, and I flagged it down. I explained that I lost my bumper back down the road, and I needed someone to help me load it into my truck. Would they mind following along and helping? The driver was a really nice guy. He looked like a rancher or something, and he said he would. I hoped I wasn't getting them involved in something bad, but when I got to the pullover, I slowed down, did a quick look around, then pulled over. Sure enough, my bumper lay there, all twisted up, but the plate was still on it. I hoped the Sasquatch had moved on. The guy from Montana got out and asked me what had happened, but I couldn't tell him the truth. So I said I'd backed into a rock and hadn't realized it until later. He looked skeptical, but helped me load it into the back of my truck. I couldn't wait to get out of there, especially after I smelled a strong skunky odor. I thanked him. Then he asked me if I was okay. I decided to tell him the truth, so I quickly told him what had happened. He commented on the strong odor and then jumped into his truck and drove away. I think he believed me. I was right behind him. The drive back was a blur. I don't really remember anything, not even the border crossing. By the time I got back to Montana and the little resort town of St. Mary, I had had it. No way did I have the courage to go back to my camp, so I rented a room. No matter that it was really expensive and I had to sneak the dogs in, I didn't care. The next day, I drove back to my camp. What I saw scared the heck out of me. All around the tent were huge bear tracks, and I know it was a grizzly. It hadn't bothered anything, but had just walked around a bunch. I was then glad I stayed at the motel, because if I came back, who knows what would have happened. Maybe that was why nobody had camped there for so long. It was prime grizz territory. I packed everything up and headed home. I'd go see Banff and Jasper another day, which I did, but from the comfort of motel rooms at night. I've never camped since, except in the desert. But I've often wondered if that Sasquatch hadn't felt like I did that day, sick of tourists everywhere. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. 
I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!